it was very much my own decision to achieve what I want to achieve. I think I've read a quote somewhere, there's no one else who wakes up in the morning to think how to make your day better. You're the only person every day who can make it better for yourself. Upskilling is very similar, you kind of have to do it all the time. Things don't stay the same, even a simple thing as social media. It changes on a weekly basis. You have to stay on top of it. I think it's like a chameleon. You constantly have to evolve and change. One thing someone told me, it was one of actually networking events, and I think it was Facebook. And this was as on a cusp, I was setting up Predella House. I had everything ready, website ready. Um, and there's this lady, she has incredibly successful online business now. I still follow her, she's brilliant. And she just said one thing to me and I was like, oh my God, this is so simple. And she's like, Trina, thank you so much for being here and a big welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You've created a name for yourself in the art industry. And like many people, you studied art before discovering more about the business side of art. So I think a really good thing for people to know would be what was it that actually drew you to the art world in the first place? Absolutely love your question. I really, um, you know what? It's it's very simple answer of it was never really something that pulled me. It was kind of it was always there. It was almost something that I couldn't get away with. It was never an act of choice. It was never something that I thought, you know what, I'll set my mind to it. It was always, always a big part of my life, which I am so happy with. And when did you first start playing around with art? Was it during childhood? Since really early years, I was always studying art in every shape or form. I've done a lot of art history. I've also studied to be a painter. So my teenage years, I spent with very smelly turpentine and oiled field studios, uh, painting still lives with oil, which was absolutely brilliant. Am I right in saying you were studying and you encountered some business modules and that was kind of your first sort of step into understanding a bit more about the business side of art. Oh, absolutely. So I've spent my teenage years studying to be an artist uh, and around my mid twenties when I did um, art business studies, I've actually wrote a business plan for Pradella House, which is my business since. So it was a group project. So uh, we all got together and thought of ways of innovative business models, how to do something new or something that hasn't done before. Um, and when we finished and when we graduated, and I remember in a group project coming up with the name Pradella House. Um, so I wrote to my classmates and I said, hey guys, do you mind if I actually do it? And they were like, well, go ahead. And so here I am, I don't know, almost 10 years later, still doing it. So Pradella House was actually something... It was a school project. That is so cool. <laughs> what was the early days of Pradella House? So we wrote a business plan all together. So we all put our heads together, what would make uh, a good business at that time. Obviously, when you're studying, you, you haven't done, gone or done so many trial and errors. You really you just, it's wishful thinking. You're yeah. thinking, oh, wouldn't it be a better world if this would happen or that would happen? Um, so we wrote this project and presented to to our lecturers. And when you left university and education then, what was sort of that next step? Was it just solely focusing on Pradella House or did you start working in the art industry? So yeah, Pradella House, I was uh, curating shows, whether we're here in London or New York. Um, just putting uh, exhibitions together, which I absolutely loved, and working with clients. Um, so yes, yeah, straight away, since since graduated, I've, I've set it up. Um, which I, even when I studied in university, I always felt like I didn't wait for the degree to finish or the studies to finish to be like, oh, and what I'll do now? I think throughout all my studies, I really remember even one lecturer thinking, uh, saying it to me, Katrina, everyone else is trying to think what they're going to do after they finish and you're the only one during a course that is trying to think what I can do now that will benefit uh, for when I finish. So when I was studying in university, I did internships in Italy and London. I was very much out there thinking, okay, I have these three years in university, how I can maximize. That's great, I can do studies. Definitely, so yeah. I remember going to my lecturers really early on and saying, hey, I really want to go to Italy. They were like, hey, you need to study. I was like, yeah, yeah but what if I hand everything in? Could I still go to Italy because I have this job opportunity I could go? I went to Italy. 
um, I went to London when I was still studying. So I think, yeah, you, you can create these paths for yourself wherever you are, whatever you do, you, you have time to do it. On the topic of creating your own path, I think that's something that's really evident in the way you've paved your career. When was it you realized, okay, I need to start putting these milestones into my career? Or did you just decide, no, I'm just gonna see where it takes me? For me, and my were different for everyone else, it was very much my own decision to achieve what I want to achieve. I think read a quote somewhere, there's no one else who wakes up in the morning to think how to make your day better. You're the only person every day who can make it better for yourself. I'm like, you're really stuck with me. It's like, of course, no one else is there, out there. Mm -hmm. We have family, we have friends. I love them dearly. Mm -hmm. But for me, what I want to do, I'm the only person who knows the path. Mm -hmm. And I think when I was studying all my early years, I was kind of thinking that there's a set path. And the moment I realized there's no set path and you really can do what you want to do, it might take a lot of hours, uh, but you can actually achieve what you have to do yourself. You know, it's a really interesting mindset to have because I find that when you are in your education, everything is kind of set for you. You know what's going to happen next year and yeah. the year after. Then you know it's going to be, okay, exams in, in the UK, it's like A-levels, go on to university or not uni and maybe get a graduate scheme afterwards or some kind of apprenticeship. But then after there is sort of a bit of an open world out there, it takes sometimes people time to adjust, but it does sound a little bit like you've always had that mindset. I don't think I chose the mindset because I wasn't born in UK, I was born in Latvia. So I came here to do my interviews to study when I was 17. Okay. So I came, I came with my portfolio, showed it to lecturers. Hey guys, I want to come and study with you. They're like, yeah, of course, come. We absolutely love, please do come and study. So on my 18th birthday, I was here by myself. So I had no family, no friends. In fact, I didn't even speak English. So I was working in an Italian restaurant to pay for my studies and I remember people thought that I was Italian only because my English was so poor and I was like, no, I've just, just, I, I just can't speak English, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so, so for me, I think it really served me well that I didn't have the net who would catch me. There was no one there after university waiting for me at home and saying, hey, you can move back in. Well, I had no choice. I had nowhere to move back in. So if I didn't do it, no one else would. Predella House, you didn't stop there. You went on to co-found an organization and I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, but is it Awita? Exactly right, yes. So we set up Awita in 2016, which I absolutely love the way we set it up. Uh, and the purpose it serves for so many women at the moment working in the art world. I think it is the network, hopefully for the women that I think I wish they've always had, of supportive women. I remember uh, attending an event of London Art Studies. I saw the event that one of their next events was TBC, like they didn't have a location. And I didn't know the lady who founded it. I didn't know much about, I just really enjoyed the studies and I used to go to their classes, which was brilliant. So I figured out who's the founder in the room and went, went up to her. I was like, hey, I saw you got TVC on your next location. I really want to attend this. This looks brilliant topic. I have a location you might want to use. I have something that might be of interest for you. And she's like, brilliant, let's do breakfast. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, of course. So I remember arriving to arts club in the morning, kind of a bit nervous, thinking, okay, well, let's do this meeting. And Kate arrives and have face dropped and I was thinking how have I messed this up am I at the wrong place am I at the wrong time and what happened she double booked me with someone else she, she had a complete diary clash with someone else so we sat down three of us to have breakfast yeah I don't know these two women at all <laughs> okay I am there thinking okay but we're all in the same industry by that time I've been running Padella House have been really going out there networking everywhere I can so we start opening uh, our address books and we're thinking, oh, okay, you should speak, should speak to servants. So, oh, actually for this project, I have someone that would be really helpful. So during the breakfast, I don't know, an hour, we've been sharing contacts and we, we've come up that how come that there isn't a professional network for women who can share contacts, who can, who are not work, who are working in the same industry, but not necessarily working in the same roles mm -hmm. to actually get together and 
do it in a professional way. Mm -hmm. So that's how we set up Awita. Uh, from that one breakfast, uh, Sigrid Kirk joined us straight away. Uh, and so we've been running it since 2016. I think what's really incredible about that story is that the very nature of your organization can trace its roots back to that dinner where you were organically doing exactly what you said you're going to do in the organization. You were networking, you were helping each other out right from the start. That confidence to go up to somebody who you don't know and you're very early in your career. Can you talk a little bit about that? Was it ever anything you were nervous about? No, I really like people. I like spending time with people and I generally with networking or with anything else. I like being nice. Actually, recently, um, you know how people talk and there was someone I worked with and we don't work anymore uh, together and this was this was many years ago. And the worst thing this person could said about me that come back to me was like, Katrina's too nice. And I was thinking, if that's the worst thing you can say about me, I am completely fine. So just being nice and kind and offering things it's really not a bad thing and that's served me well in everything that I do and that for me is kind of not even something I have to think about it just comes naturally I kind of want to be nice and kind and that's all there is really I think that's that's a nice thing to hear especially in industries that can be quite competitive but it sounds a little bit like you like to create opportunities for others well you've definitely done that with your organization but also I think being nice doesn't necessarily need, need to mean that you're laid back. You can still work incredibly hard. You can still fill your diary back to back every day and do as much good work as you can. But it doesn't mean that you have to always have agenda or only use people because they would benefit you. And yeah. I find people like that burn out really quickly and just don't last very long. What were the other reasons why you felt there was a need to have a female association in the art industry? What I love in our events that they're actually very open and we also find that women when they're in a room and they all know that they're all women in a room the conversation is quite open and it's obviously Chatham House rules at every event that we've kind of openly share and we know it's not gonna be repeated um but it's it's brilliant it's very open discussion and very very friendly what are some of your top tips when it comes to networking you know what i thought about it i thought about networking one thing is listen and ask questions well it's two things listen and then ask questions i think people sometimes think that networking is going and pitching yourself it really is not about pitching yourself it really is you're not trying to sell anything and again, some research I've read that after a conversation, if um, there's, I think someone measured after every conversation how happy you are. So there is some sort of statistic. The more you speak in conversation, the happier you are after the conversation. You, you got the airtime. So I find that the best way for me to network is ask ask questions and listen mm. and then just ask questions actually be really mindful with your listening and ask questions that don't matter but my one thing not to do is go networking with pitching okay. i think it's so draining when when you go out there and you have an agenda um for me that's a, a big no for networking so the old school way of having business cards in your back pocket or... Have a business card after meaningful conversation. You the Networking, yes, you can exchange, but you don't want to just to be there pitching your idea yeah. from the moment you said hello. You want, to, you, you want to ask questions, you want to know more and have a meaningful conversation. I, I kind of get it. Like you want something out of it, out of networking, but I guess if you go too heavy in on an agenda, then you're not really taking in that experience naturally and that can sometimes come off as well oh it completely comes off straight away it's it's not a mildly sensible i think it's so obvious when people come with the agenda it really comes across but also if you ask questions and listen and are able to engage with people yeah. you might find out something that's even better than your initial pitch you thought hey i could come and i don't know sell something whatever but if you have a bit more of a conversation you might find something else yeah so and also it's about building relationships i think the best things for me that has happened is from the relationships i've built and it, by burning something in the first instance would definitely not lead to those 
long-term wonderful relationships. I'm really interested to know about like the female experience within the art world. I know when we talked a little bit about this interview, you were telling me a really interesting statistic about how female artist sales are not really at level with their male counterparts. Why do you think this is? You know what, this is such a huge question to unpack, it really is. And I think historically, um, women have been written less about. It's not just that, that they've produced less work, it's that there has been less written about amazing women in, in art history. Okay. Katie Hessel has just published a book about uh, women artists, which is brilliant. It's highly recommend, excellent, excellent book. So it's a huge topic which spans back centuries. I think we can change. I think we're in a good, really, really good trajectory of seeing how auction houses at the moment are promoting their female artists, mm -hmm. how I think we're on a really up. I think this is a really important time in life when we are seeing more and more uh, good things happen for female artists. Have you noticed the tide change a little bit? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. We just were now at Philips Auction House not long ago where our co-founder Sigrid uh, also did a panel talk uh, about the subject and it was wonderful to see how many female artists Philips are now uh, putting in their auctions. And what I loved hearing from the auction house is that they actually respond what their clients want. So it's not that they're pushing down, this is, this is what I want to do, but actually hearing that they really much respond from the market, which is brilliant news. I really like to know a little bit about balancing when you've got Bridella House, but you've also got this um, nonprofit organization which you're working on. And you've also got your personal life and everything. Like, how do you balance everything and make sure you're still achieving all your milestones? I really like that it comes across balanced. <laughs> <laughs> well, how are you not balancing? <laughs> you know, what, what I really think, it's a calling. It really is. I think being an art world, I am so lucky that I'm in a world that I really love. That going to a gallery is not a chore. Going to an exhibition is not a chore. Putting a client proposal together also is not a chore because I'll be like, hey guys, how about look at this or look at that. So it really is enjoyable. It really is both sides. And I find doing Awita, Awita events really for me is, gives such a buzz for me. Wow. Every time we finish an event, it's a huge rush when we set up event. Every time we've done an event, I have this really amazing feeling, just like a high, I guess. Um, so yes, not a chore, but I'm glad it comes across balanced. <laughs> so when it comes to skills, you work quite heavily in the art industry, then you're also managing businesses. Have you found any particular areas that you've really had to upskill in that's helped you? Wow, upskill. You know what? Um, I think there is a similar question also about challenges. And I think upskilling is very similar. You kind of have to do it all the time things don't stay the same. Even a simple thing as social media, it changes on a weekly basis. You have to stay on top of it. I think it's like a chameleon. You constantly have to evolve and change. With Awita, we've been running since 2016. The times we had to reinvent themselves, ourselves, to be able to stay relevant. What's some of the things you've had to do to try and reinvent? reinvent um, I think online is a big thing that mm -hmm. came and then went away again, I think. It was also kind of judging the timing when people did want to connect and they do want to come to events and when they don't really okay. want to come to events. So when we uh, re-emerged back from COVID, we actually really saw a drop in, in attendance. And I think people were still scared to re-emerge back. And whereas right now we're feeling and finding that everyone's back, ready to party, ready to mingle, yeah, ready yeah. to really be at the quality events but we had to listen we had to adapt we can't just keep doing the same thing and expect expect the same results mm -hmm. we have to be able to respond really quickly to what's happening in the world how about when it comes to working in a team so obviously you have the co-founders how do you decide who does what good question you know what we're really good at knowing what's our superpowers okay um so i think we don't ask someone who's not good at something else do stuff that they wouldn't feel comfortable with or wouldn't want doing so luckily between us we have skill sets that really complement each other uh, which is brilliant and also having a non-profit organization 
any weight we pull we know we have to do ourselves there's no one else who will do it for us yeah. so if we change our mind or decide to do something we're the ones who are spearheading it i was thinking before this interview that you know you have professions where it, it's difficult to get into but there's still a clear way to get into them so whether you want to be like a lawyer doctor counter electrician plumber like there's steps we can do to do that but with what you've done you know there aren't really clear steps i wonder if you have any advice for somebody who is in a similar industry or the same industry where they are looking to pave their own career what are some of those things that they can start thinking about i think you let it up beautifully you can have a career path that is very clear you don't have to have the set rules or set labels or set steps and I think when I was studying, I was struggling to see myself as a gallerist or an artist, and I was confused. I mm -hmm. love both. What, what, what can I be? I want to paint, but also see myself being in an auction house or a gallery. And I really didn't know that there is also a path that is neither, and that's a beautiful place to be, that you can have a wonderful conversation both with artists and clients and gallerists and only say mid 20s I realize the unique position of not quite fitting in neither of those categories okay. which for a long time I felt oh god well I'm not quite there I'm not quite there I love this I love that but then I put them together like a little jigsaw puzzle and and made it work for me and I think that for me is happiness because I so often see people who are like oh I'm not happy with this or that that for me the answer was doing it myself that's, and making the sets skill sets around me that works for me that's really cool to hear because i think sometimes in those situations it is really easy then to think i'm not fitting into exactly one of these categories so i'm just going to go along with whatever i think i should be doing or people should think i should be doing but with you you kind of rejected that and was like no i'm just going to create exactly i just what I want. create what i want to do every day <laughs> i look at art i see these amazing fabulous women i just i'm just having a blast right now so something we like to talk about on this podcast a lot is about being open about the things that we don't know about and hoping that any information we can give others is going to help them along their journey. So I think it would be really useful for people to know more about anything that you didn't necessarily know at the start of your journey, but has been really, really useful to you that you use now. A beautiful question. Thank you so much. Um, actually, I've, I've rethought my answer three times while, while you were saying that. I think one thing someone told me it was one of actually networking events and I think it was Facebook and this was as on a cusp I was setting up Predella House. I had everything ready, website ready um, and there's this lady, she has incredibly successful online business now. I still follow her, she's brilliant. And she just said one thing to me and I was like, oh my God, this is so simple. And she's like, just do it. You'll probably get it wrong. Just do it. Just, just jump. You, it's never going to be right. If you're going to wait until it's right, it won't be. It will never be right. You'll never be truly happy. Just do it. And for me, that just gave me a freedom to let myself not be right and still do it. Mm -hmm. And it is very much like building a plane while you fly it. You know what? I will just set off and I'll do it. And when you are at that speed, you can't really stop. You can't really pull back. You just have to do it. So my only, not even advice, the only thing I know is just do it mm -hmm. and there's no set path you can set it up for yourself but when you're up there when you're flying you just have to do it then that's it where can people find out more about you instagram are we to london and personally katrina alexa rymel on instagram thank you very much thanks for sharing your story with us thank you it's brilliant very positive thank you